Hello listeners, hello watchers, if you're watching this on YouTube, and welcome to the next in my series of Mindful Meets. And today I'm delighted to be speaking to somebody who I have been trying to get on the podcast for quite a long time, but she is a very, very busy woman, very much in demand. But today we have her all to ourselves, and that is Bernie Wright. Hello, Bernie. Hello there. Thank you very much for saying that, Laurie. Thank Not you at all. Uh, so who is Bernie? Well, Bernie is a BACP registered psychotherapist and counsellor. She's a clinical supervisor in the area of eating and eating disorders. She specialises with her company, NEDS, in neurodiversity around eating and disordered eating. And I met Bernie when I did my training when she was clinical lead at the National Centre for Eating Disorders. So that is the link. Um, and today I wanted to get Bernie on to give us her knowledge, her expertise, the benefit of all of that, just to understand a little more about eating disorders, about the different types of disorders, how we might spot them either in ourselves or in other people and how we might support and any other things that happen to come up. If you listen to this podcast regularly, you'll know that they are quite organic conversations that we have um, and we'll just see where it goes. But um, Bernie. Where it goes, who knows, Laura? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Who knows? Um, Bernie's a very, very sunny person, I could just tell you. And those, of, if you happen to be listening rather than watching, she's surrounded by vases of sunflowers in her study. She's got bright jewellery on. She's a um, very, very sunny disposition and, and spreads a lot of care and warmth and support wherever she goes with the people that she that she works with so I'm sure this is going to be a really interesting and enjoyable conversation for for you all listening. Thank you very much Laurie actually the sunflowers came from when I started working online continually when we went into Covid and I went back online and I was working like all of us 24 7 because we got so busy at that time mm. and um, they cheered me up when I was feeling like all of us really 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 closed in um so yes so i'm uh, obviously a specialist in the subject i've been so for many years i originally decided to actually train and do this work because i was working with a, a lovely young person many years back for a long time actually i was it was my placement and it was right at the end that this young person said to me is there anything else i said is there anything else i could have helped you with and she said i'd love you to help me with my purging and I was so shocked at the time, vomiting, I had absolutely no idea. So I rushed off to the National Centre of Eating Disorders as soon as I could get the time and trained in the subject and I've never looked back. So if we work as practitioners, it's really, really important that we actually really can spot and understand um, the, the, the eating disorder personality within our practice. Mm -hmm. And to also bear in mind, which is vital for us all to think, if you are practitioners out there, that 50% of people who come to you in larger bodies will have an eating disorder. That's really interesting. So let's just say that again. So 50% of people who are in larger bodies will have some sort of eating disorder, disordered eating pattern yeah. going on. Which is why, which is why we, which is why, you know, people like you and I, Laurie, would be. Um, not sort of recommending people go off to um, weight, weight, you know, weight loss in, institutions, and mm. um, because if they've got an eating disorder, then you're going to make it far worse. Yes, yeah. and I and and that's something that I think well, you and I and lots of other people in our mm. field work work very hard, don't we, to impress upon people that actually restriction and mm. and over control and trying to put limits and trying to um put people on very very strict plans is is so counterproductive and actually does make it worse so why why is that what's actually happening it's, it's that fascinating worse? isn't it it, it makes it worse you know because once you, the very first diet you go on um and if if we think about the work that we do Laurie, you know finding out where it started how it started um, I would say probably, I don't know, 70, 80% of my clients will have, you know, I don't work one-to-one -one anymore, 
um, but will actually, it will be started with a first eyes. Mm. So it's, it's, it's it, and once we actually get into that focus on food, weight and shape, and mm. um, then it's pretty much a downward spiral. And then we get into the yo-yo dieting mm. and, 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 and a lifetime goes, go, goes on after that. And it's yes. something about see, you know, getting to the root of the problem so that becomes history as, a, as, a, as, as opposed to the, the ever, ever overriding future. Yes, and I think that some, maybe listening to this, some people will think, well, eating disorders have to start with trauma. They have to start with something huge and significant in someone's life. But perhaps then, in fact, that is not always the case. No, if we think about, as, as we know, that you, you've got factors that make, make pretty much make sure that you will be predisposed to developing an eating disorder. And then perhaps it's something significant in, in our lives that may trigger it, you know, parents separating, divorce, you know, trauma of any description, abuse of any description, or, and diets, you know, mm. once we start, and, and self-esteem huge, and, it, you know, it's, it's a really precarious way to build the self-esteem, which is why we, we, in my training, we always look very much at, at what life can be thought. Yes, how, how and, that it's, and that it's an holistic approach, looking yes, at absolutely. the situations yeah. that, A, have gone on before, but also mm -hmm. are going on currently. It might be people, it might be work factors, it might be a sense of, sense of self, who they interact with, mm -hmm. as well as, of course, there's a, there's a strong role to play, isn't there, um, on the nutrition side of things, which I think also people don't necessarily um, understand or make that direct connection. Oh, spot on. And I think that um, I've, you know, I've, I've, in all the years I've worked and it's become a bit of a dinosaur, so it's been a lot of years. Um, and my work, my least success has been with people who didn't take on the nutrition side. Mm -hmm. We didn't actually edu you know, work, work with a nutritionist or with the information that they can actually provide. Yes. themselves on it. And yes. uh, it takes two things to work. You know, I mean, years and years, I mean, I'm going back sort of 15 years ago when I, when I was sort of saying that uh, in order to recover from eating disorder and disordered eating, it, was, it took more than a therapeutic relationship. And it also took, you know, the physiology and all of that that goes alongside it. At that stage, I was pretty, I had a pretty rough time on social media for suggesting that. Uh, but no, I don't think anybody would now. I don't think anybody really would, would do that now. It's interesting how, you know, the social media waves come and go, isn't it? You know, because when, when I trained at the centre, one of the modules that we had was entitled treat psychological interventions for obesity mm -hmm. because that's the clinical word but of course you know there is there is some difficulty with using that word isn't there on social media and there's the health at every size movement and all these different sort of views about what you should or you shouldn't say and and I think sometimes the main point is sort of missed that actually the point is that we're trying to help people be the happiest and healthiest that they possibly can can be but I think people can get very sort of um locked in can't they about what is the right and wrong and wrong language do you do you have a view on that Bernie oh I have lots of views on that Laurie lots and lots of views <laughs> on that um I have been I've had, I've had a terrible time on social media for for actually um, suggesting that um, using the word, the O word, mm. and so so basically, it's it it's a, a terminology that I believe people will Google if they're looking to train in supporting people who are in larger bodies, and it's as simple as that. You know, do would I like them to have a different word? Of course I would, mm. um, but if it means that we don't have practitioners filling, you know, my courses and the national centres courses, then it's a very sad occasion because we need to get people out and working very much in this field to support people who really desperately need that support mm. and talking about people who need it then so we were saying earlier that probably 50 percent of people in a larger body have some sort of eating disorder di disordered eating should we actually before i ask you this question should we sort of make any differentiation between eating disorder and disordered eating do you think there is one i think i mean you know eating disorder is very much it's, it's a diagnosis it's uh 
it, 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 it is absolutely something that is, is, is dangerous. And disordered eating, I mean, you know, predominantly so many people are disordered. You know, they might get to eat, they might, or they might have periods where they're disordered, mm -hmm. and that they might just get really busy and over focused and pull out of, fall out of sync. Or that our eating might become very dis disordered if we've got, you know, trauma or family situations going on. But, but it, you know, and, and ultimately, you know, eating disorders are, you know, absolutely traumatizing over the time. They are like PSTD. Um, so, but I always feel, I've always felt very passionate about this. If I, if I say to people, I always say when I'm teaching, I always say, you know, as you're sitting in front of me today, zero, you don't think about food, weight and shape at all. Ten, that's what you think about. Where are you on that subject? Mm. And most people say to me, 10, 15, 20. Uh, so basically we have that, then they've got an eating problem. Um, yes. So whether I'm not, I'm not a great one for labels, Laurie, to be absolutely honest with you, but if, if, if it's, if it's taking up the, every essence of their waking moments, or, you know, and, and I've been working with eating disorders for so many years, mm -hmm. and, you know, and I'm, I'm well aware that at the beginning, they're, 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 the availability that they actually, with me, is quite limited. Yes, yes. So do you think that there are more people with diagnosed eating disorders or eating disorders that exist but they are at the moment undiagnosed than they used to be or is it just that they just we that we, we just know about them more it's just it's just easier to have them diagnosed we or or they the actual people experiencing it are sort of able to observe and and um be aware of them more than used to happen i think there's a lot there's a huge i mean it's a total epidemic 100 percent and also, there's a huge amount of undiagnosed uh, eating disorders. Mm. And um, as you know, I work very, very much with the neurodivergent client, which mm. is huge in eating disorders and disordered eating. And um, and it's very, you know, so it's vital that we not. I think a diagnosis is really useful mm. if it can if if it can get the support that it needs. Mm. Um, at the moment, as you know, Laurie, you know, with, with anorexia, for example, we have to be very, very, very ill in order to get the diagnosis. And there is that issue because people in larger bodies, and there's a huge amount of people in larger bodies who have got uh, atypical anorexia. Um, and my hope going forward that we, we, we just, anorexia is anorexia, whether a person is a larger body or a person is in a smaller body. Because you know, from my experience and training and working for so many years, the, the, the thoughts in the head is exactly the same. The pain is exactly the same. The trauma is the same. Um, but we put so much emphasis on the, 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 the client who is um, in, a, in, a, in a very small mal malnourished body. And um, arguably, people who are, who are um, you know, in a larger body are also undernourished. Yes. Um, so a malnourished. So it's something about the educating so that we actually know so much more. And I think that's that's such an interesting point to make because I think most people out there have an idea of what anorexia is, mm -hmm. in that it presents in an underweight body and it's probably somebody who doesn't doesn't eat and doesn't want to put weight on. They have an idea of, of bu bulimia, they have an idea of binge eating mm -hmm. but there are so many other different combinations aren't there and I think what you said just then is 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 quite a eureka moment I I would think for some people listening in that it doesn't matter what size you are it's the thoughts it's the attitudes it's the thinking it's the it's the drivers that actually are synonymous with the eating disorder rather than what's being presented exactly Laurie. and and you know i feel total sadness when they're, they're often as you you'll see on social media there seems to be a, a, a lot of sort of fighting between people in larger bodies mm -hmm. and a lot of uh, 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 fighting with, uh, uh, with the people who are malnourished and is skeleton life and yet they're all in psychological pain yes you know, the, the, the similarities are more together than they are apart yes and i guess that also as somebody starts to recover from a particular eating disorder other manifestations happen so 
um, I had direct experience of this where I was working with a young woman in her 20s. She she had experienced anorexia. She was she considered no longer experiencing anorexia, but she was occasionally purging. And so she had labeled herself bulimic. Mm. But of course, getting to the bottom of it, she still had the anorexic drivers. They were just manifesting manifesting themselves in a different way. Which um, is anorexic purging type. Yeah. 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 And that's exactly. and people can sort and get that diagnosis. So well. Yes. And of course, we don't necessarily sit in front of someone and say, oh, well, what you have is this or what you have is that. No, of no. course <laughs> we don't. But but from a from a, a coach therapist point of view, it's it's important, isn't it, to make those observations. And so so are there any other um, sort of unusual combinations or types of eating disorders that might be quite useful for our listeners to sort of try and understand um, outside the three, I think what people consider the three main, so anorexic and anorexia, bulimia and binge binge eating. That might be helpful. Yeah, binge eating is probably the hugest one of the, of the lot, isn't it? That's that's where and 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 grossly mis uh, mis um, represented in men, um, because we it's sort of a gender thing. We we assume or talk a lot about the uh, you know the the gen the, the genders of, of that it's a, a female issue almost, but it, but it, predominantly it's huge in men, and there's a lot of uh, shame about it, you know, uh, coming forward. Um, and diverting slightly, I will come back to what you just said. No, no, please do. The same way with um, people who are in larger bodies that decide to go for um, bariatric surgery, weight loss surgery, which I am absolutely not an advocate of for ever, ever, ever. Um, I would just love to think that the whole world would get people when they were sort of so much younger um, until it becomes a real terrible issue for them and they feel they have no other choice because it is definitely not an easy way out. It's it is so so difficult, um, and so so there's a lot of people who are binge eaters who will be um, who will eventually go to a cosmetics to weight loss surgery. And I you know, just like to impose that if people do that, they really need to get two things. So anybody here listening who is thinking about having weight loss surgery, I implore you, please do two things. In short, get, get check out if you're screening yourself for an eating disorder first, and check if you're if there's any chance you're neurodivergent also, um, because mm. if you're neurodivergent, you will need specialist input, which is um, your neurodiversity. So whether you're ADHD, autistic, or any other under the uh, under the huge umbrella, make sure you don't go undergo surgery because then you end up feeling a failure, and it was never your fault because you just didn't have the right input. So yeah, I, I, I diverted. So, so, so we no, no, no. I mean, and I, and I actually want to come back. Okay. <laughs> so you, we just ping me an answer for the previous one if we can even remember what the question was. It doesn't matter if we can't. <laughs> yes, I think you were asking me about um, other other eating disorders. Yeah. We 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 look we 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 don't tend to to talk too much about the orthorexia, do we? There's the, the mm -hmm. pure one, the one that people feel almost like morally superior if they're actually doing it, but you know, that sort of clean eating. Um, and yet from my perspective from the years I've worked, it's for me, it's a flight out of anorexia, you know, those, and it causes the same type of stress and anxiety that lies beneath, but you know, once again, lies beneath it all. Yes. So then let's talk about those two topics that you just mm -hmm. raised. So, the surgery then so are you saying then that really most most people could um resolve their weight and their eating issues with the right intervention and that actually the surgery might not be necessary um i'm not saying that because genetically some people as you know as you know um what i am saying is that a lot and lots of people that i've worked with who went on to um, have bariatric surgery have said to me so many times, I wish I'd have seen somebody when I was 15, 16, 20 mm. that could have helped me with this. Because yes. a lot of people don't know that they're, they've, they've even got an eating disorder. They just think that they're, they just think that they're lazy, they're, 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 which is anything but the truth as we absolutely know. Yes. 
So what, what I'm hope what I'm hoping is that people who you know if, if, as we change in society and 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 if and if the government start listening, which would be absolutely amazing, please if you are listening, um, to think to think about actually just doing interventions that that don't make people ashamed and stigmatized mm -hmm. and um, and if, if we if we treat people in the right way and give them the right treatment really really early on. You know, nutritionally, physiology, um, psychologically, all that support. Uh, my sense is that things would change dramatically. Um, and I, I don't know about you, though, but we were absolutely shocked um, when we were going through COVID. Um, and I supervise uh, the work of uh, many therapists. And um, we were just so shocked with when the government put out all this stuff about, you know, if you are. If you are in a larger body, you've got more chance of actually getting dying or getting really ill. And, and it, it, it didn't make people want to, to, to go on a diet. It really didn't. I mean, you know, we would do a lot of my supervisors would do some brilliant work with people in larger bodies. And yet we all noticed this thread of people coming back in really ashamed, distressed um, because of the messages. Mm -hmm. And as, wait, as fear is not a motivator, for health, health gain, I say, not weight loss, um, it had the absolute opposite effect, and it always does. Yes, and of course it was such a such a depressing time for so many people that then to layer that, that, that stigma and that negativity on top of that... It was awful. Is awful, oh. and particularly where so many people who have issues with eating have have self-esteem issues have confidence issues have sociability issues mm. just made yeah. it a hundred times worse it made it it was just it for me for me at that time it was a form of mental abuse mm. and and, I'm, and I, I feel so sad that we still keep thinking you know um lose weight and you know lose so many key, you know all these weight loss lose weight immediately immediately so those who did lose weight because they were those who did, did actually just probably starve themselves almost to death when they were so terrified when they, we got these messages mm. my sense is that each and every one of them or at least 85 percent percent yeah all, all back on and more by now and so will be feeling worse about themselves yeah, i failed again because of, yeah 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 yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and of course, that's why the work that we do is holistic and looks at body acceptance, doesn't it? And it looks at trying to help people feel comfortable. That's not to say that they might not want to change their bodies. They might not Absolutely. want to feel healthier. Nothing wrong with that at all. Mm -hmm. But that as they go through that process, we're sort of building an acceptance and a sense of gratitude so that they don't have that sort of manic urgency and that they don't allow their body and their eating behavior to define them which i always think is such a such an important thing to try and reverse with people well i i absolutely could not agree more laurie and you know the, all the years i've worked on as i'm a dinosaur absolutely all the years i've worked it's a case of you know people will gain health if they actually go to, to the right input with the right with the, with the right team, look at the right nutrition, the right psychotherapeutic input if need be, or coaching, mm -hmm. and um, and they will. But do you know what I found? It just doesn't matter so much. They will gain health, but when they leave at the last day, they walk out the door. Um, it's it, they, you know, they're not talking about. Oh my goodness, I've and I look, I've just jumped on the scales, and I've, you know, it 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 it, it doesn't matter. And and I think our work is to to support our clients to be assertive, so that they can say if they, you know, to say no to other people, and then they can say no to food. Yeah. Um, and and that's obviously a, a, another real issue. And to to be and just to yeah, so to take it on board that you know we don't build our self esteem on our food weight, our, our weight and our shape. It's really mm. a precarious way to build our self-esteem. So it's something about working with that, with and, and with, you know, with, with professionals like yourself, Laura. Really. Yes, and of course that's a bit of a constant fight, isn't it? If oh, yeah. we look at, <laughs> If we look at the images and the presentation, particularly of of women, I mean, mm. I think it's improving. 
but you know the general presentation about success and people on television and in magazines it does suggest a certain value yes linked to size weight and how you look rather than that sort of intrinsic internal value which I know is something that you and I both sort of try and um try and build for people but I think the tide's changing a little don't you think we see more diversity I'm 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 really hoping so I think it's it's certainly it, it's, it's I mean I've been sort of plowing away with that for, for years now and I'm just hoping that that people are beginning to to listen I do know that, that there's a lot of that, that from my experience parents are taking on board you know not to talk about their weight and their shape in the front of their children you know um, i mean how many uh, people you work with i've worked with countless um whose whose mum is i must go away sort of part of a family member i'm getting so fat and yeah. look at me um you know and and and, and starting another diet on monday morning and um and it and it, it just builds that same you know and we all as you know we look at food scripts what you know what 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 was said to us about yes. what we eat and what you know what 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 what's the value of food and for exactly. some people in our families it can be the, the currency of love so we have to be really quite careful of what we value yes because sometimes that that feeding experience is a language of love from that other mm. other person i mean i remember that my grandmother was a young woman during the during the war uh, she was in service. She was a cook. And so the minute food became more plentiful in the 60s and 70s when I was growing up, that was what she wanted to do. She just wanted to feed us. And, and if we fell over, we got we got given chocolate. And if we had a good day at school, oh, we got given chocolate. And, you know, and it was and and reflecting on that, you know, that is I see that as a positive thing yeah. from her. Yeah. But reflecting on my own disordered relationship with eating and my binge eating disorder that actually I can see that it probably actually wasn't that helpful for me but it you know at the time it was a it was a gesture of of love and I have to see it as that absolutely and we, and I always say to people you know when I work with families you know tell your tell your child they can have their broccoli after they've had their ice cream because <laughs> it, yes. it, it's, it's, it's that isn't it I, I, oh I love that yes yeah. I was very much brought up on the, you know, the, the treats after treats, and it was a case that that was all I was waiting for, you know. Yes, the... yes, 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 exactly. Um, I did want to talk about what you mentioned earlier, because I know that this is a real passion of yours, and this is a real big area that's being investigated and researched and worked in, and that is the neurodiversity connection with eating disorders and eating behavior so do please tell us a little more about that Bernie okay I will um, <laughs> um yeah, yeah it's 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 huge in anorexia um there's a huge connection between anorexia and uh and, and, and autism for example um and what we and what, what we what we don't we, we haven't really taken on board is how it affects recovery because if as, as, as practitioners, if we don't look, um, for example, about other uh, sensory issues, you know, for some people, you know, if they're hypersensitive, you know, to certain things or or, or foods they just can't literally abide by, uh, but due to the sensory inputs on them, then you know they're not going to recover in the way that we've been attempting to get people to recover. You know, and if they're ADHD, um, and of course with, 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 with autism, there could be some real rigidity. And another, when I did my training recently, uh, we had, I got, actually had six people who were all neurodivergent um, and all, had all been given sort of diagnosis of all sorts of things, you know, and, and they'd, they'd come to me for a three hour breakthrough. And it turned out that each and every one of them, they weren't emotional, I'll say personality disorder, they weren't. Um, they basically had ADHD and autism, and and of course they've been treated in a way, and and one of them had actually been in rehab three times. Mm -hmm. Nobody had all, and psychiatric tests, psychiatric a personality disorder a test, and no one had asked her what she actually ate. So if we can find out, if we can find out, or, or ADHD people, and I'm one of them. Um, you know, there's a lot of impulsivity and a lot of hyper-focus and, and, and they can be great at a diet for a little while. 
and I mean, and off work early, they can lose sort of three stone in five minutes, you know, that type mm. of thing. Sort of an all or nothing. Yeah, all or yeah. nothing. Mm. And of course, if we don't, and, and if, if for ADHD people and dyslexic people, dyspraxic people, people who find things or organisation, anybody that flies under that huge umbrella, one in five people are neurodivergent, then we have to tailor them. We have to, you know, we have to work really carefully to meet that person in a neurodivergent way, not in a neurotypical way. You know, so it, so for me, I, you know, I don't automatically expect people to fill in laborious food diaries. Mm. They'll do it different ways with me. They might just talk it into a, their phone. Um, yes, or, or take or, photos maybe, I suppose, that, yeah. Or take or, or photos, um, mm. or just that if you find a way to connect. And so if someone's autistic, I'm not going to assume that they're going to be able to come online and look at me. Um, mm. so, so I might sit side by side, or I might have my think. We just need to find out um, how we can actually connect someone who, who, whose brain is, is different. And I oh, think, yes. Yeah. And is and does that temper a little bit the expectation of well, a they're absolutely delighted when you can you know when you know I'm, I'm not I'm not gonna you know and you have to be really careful here because some people don't want to even if I'm 100% convinced in my mind this person's neurodivergent it's the pacing as a therapist we're not gonna you know we'll ask certain questions and we'll we'll, we'll work in different ways but it, we just have to treat it differently, mm. you know. And I, I'm, I'm just talking about the bariatric client, and then a lot of them. When I'm, I'm working on, uh, with uh, on, at the moment on, a, on, a, on a, a very very large group, and you know, there's a huge amount of, of people who are ADHD who may be impulsive and they will binge eat. Um, and it's something about us understanding that. And then working so so i will so i'm working with someone who's a binge eater for example and i suspect even if they don't know that they are neurodivergent um then i will say to them okay so that, you know we've got time time clocks and things they're brilliant things so you space out the time they will eat so i for example have to actually set a time to bib for me to eat because i get so hyper focused i would just work on until uh, and i did have a, an eating problem because i used to I used to just work so, so, you know, I'm so passionate about what I do and whatever I've done. Um, and then I just go on to five o'clock, six o'clock, realize I hadn't eaten, absolutely starving, and then eat everything that wasn't tied down. Mm. You know, and, 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 and that is the problem. We, 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 we just need to, to, to bring in the, the, how the ADHD way of working into the compulsivity and the impulsivity and work ways around that. Yes. But as you say, without labelling, just sort of forming maybe an idea, even if we're not 100 percent sure. But and of course, so much of this of this work. And I think this is one of the things that really struck me when I did my my training at the National Centre was how important it is to create that self-efficacy and that mm -hmm. empowerment and yeah. to and to essentially give someone a toolkit or give them give them a number of ways to perhaps think about about food or to behave around food or to plan or to strategize and sort of help them then learn how to use the tools for themselves exactly it's that empowerment is that self-efficacy mm -hmm. and and and, and, and also, whilst also appreciating that that the whites boundaries are vital in our work you know that's you know that's what we're taught that's what we do they're, they're like fences they make with neighbors we also have to know that the ADHD may be, may be the type of, you know, for example, if I work with someone who's ADHD, I will remind them that they have a session the next day, and I did. Mm -hmm. So I might say, you know, so I say, you know, so if, if I, I'll, I'll ask questions like, you know, do people say you were really uh, chatty at school or, you know, lacks concentration um, or forgetful, they sound forgetful, then I would say things like, would you like me to just give you a gentle reminder of the, the, the day before, mm. you know, and uh, for people who are um, autistic, I might, uh, and, and find it, and, and, and finding the relationship to begin with, because what, if you're working with someone who's autistic, um, it will take a longer time to, to, to develop that trust, because there's, mm. and there's, there's a, to get behind the mask, because there is so much masking, mm. um, and to take time, and sometimes, you know, so I will say to people, you know, so, do you want, you know, so, and some people, for an hour, it's a long time. So for some people might just want 25 minutes to start with. 
Yes. And it's, so it's broken down. Yes. Yeah. And do, you, do you want me to be? Do you want me to be online? And 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 also very simple things with if you're working with neurodivergent people is how you're you know how you're consulting your needs. You know, is it too loud? I mean, that, that, you know, this this will probably be a, a nightmare for a lot of clients. So, I, but my work, my consulting room downstairs is very, very, very neurodivergent from Yes, and, and calm. Yes, mm -hmm. and do we know if people who have issue with issues with food who are in larger bodies, do we know if there is more of a link with? neurodiversity than we thought before so outside of eating disorders but generally in um people in larger bodies who tend to overeat do we think that there may be a larger percentage with neurodivergence? I, I think it's it's absolutely i think that um if we if i'm looking at my the, all the work i do and all of the uh when i supervise the work of my supervisees absolutely Mm. You know, it's interesting, amount, isn't it? The yeah. ADHD, you mm. know, uh, autism, um, you know, it just it just runs rampant through it. Mm. And we've got to be really careful because when I, when I was actually working with also um, Zoe Barnett, she actually wrote um, Inside My Head, a very very good book on atypical anorexia. If anyone's interested, and I did, she'd actually been for an, a year and a half in actually um, outpatients, and this is all in her book. I'm saying nothing that she hasn't shared with myself and all of the people that I've trained in the past. Um, but she, but you know, so she came to me for a, for a meeting, and and she felt such. She had a total relapse and felt absolutely awful. She'd written this book that was very very well known. And I said to her, you know, has anybody ever thought that there might be something else, you know, that, that was going on for you? And she said, well, don't you think atypical anorexia is enough? And she laughed. She's very funny. And she was so small. <laughs> um, and I said, well, I've just got a real curiosity if there's any attention deficit. And of course, she's since been diagnosed and she has. Yeah. Um, so so it, it's, it's a case that she says, I won't do diaries in the way you want me to. You know, and they used to say to her, we well, you know when she was in the inpatient and she bounced up and down, she was flattening, trying to keep her focus in my room, she was all over the place. Um, and uh, they said, we know what you're doing, you're trying to burn calories. No, she was not. Yes. No. It's, what, it's what people who are ADHD do. Yes. So I would say to people, you know, they can bring whatever, whatever, whatever keeps them calm. You know, some people, I've got a whole box of stuff down here that people, you know, uh, uh, stress toys that can people use. Um, yeah, just, just to come on and, and to know that we'll we'll meet them wherever they are, not where we are. And I'm wondering, listening to you, that although we, you know, in some circumstances, labelling is not helpful. You know, there could be people listening, watching now, that are thinking, now it all makes sense. Yes. Now it all makes sense to me. I, I know it's not yes. my fault, <laughs> you know, and. And in all contexts of what we do, we probably say that quite a lot. It is not your fault. Yes, we always but, you know, that. this specifically, that this actually could be a massive revelation. Oh, it, I mean, every time I train, and I'm training for many, many years, um, I mean, the phone calls I get on a Monday morning um, for people who realise that they are, new, you know, neurodivergent. And, mm. and in fact, one of the people on my panel that, that, that uh, I was interviewed for my panel um, and she's gone back to train as a clinical psychotherapist because she'd fallen out of it because she's brilliant um, but she'd fallen out of it because she got to, because of the overwhelm and that's it with people who are autistic is there's, there's an awful lot of overwhelm and you know so food planning and menu planning can be really very very extremely stressful yeah so that's, that's why we really need people you know like yourself and myself who can sort of coach people and hold their hands mm. through it while and, in the autonomy and self-efficacy yes and thinking about that overwhelm of course for emotional eaters without the neurodiverse layer mm. eating takes away that sense of overwhelm doesn't it and it and it and it detracts from the stress so i can imagine that if if there's an autistic element that actually me means that overwhelm is much more dominant that actually food could play an even even stronger yes, and important absolutely part. that calming that keeping calm mm -hmm. um and the, the overwhelm to actually prepare and plan and with you know uh, plan food is just phenomenally difficult um so reaching for things that are very very easily available you know like chocolates and, and yes and, 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 and that it, it, it's it's 
absolutely understandable why, why people absolutely would. Mm-hmm. And why some people find that planning so much harder and need more support. I mean, even, you know, down to saying, right, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, here is your shopping list. This is how you do it, which, of course, neither of us mind doing at all. But it is interesting how some people need that and some people, you know, don't. And perhaps yeah. what we're talking about is part or all of the reason. And because of the ADHD personality, it's boring. And yeah. boredom's like, it's boredom's like kryptonite, isn't it? As that <laughs> really book, um, uh, ADHD 2, 2.0, um, Halloway said. Um, you know, and so it's something about, you know, meeting and understanding. And so, you know, I will say, you know, if, if I think someone's ADHD, I might say, it's really boring, isn't it? <laughs> how, how can we, how can we make it more exciting yes exactly how can we make it so, so there's, there's lots of ways and and of course they're less likely then to 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 because you know i don't you know i i people that come to me and they have been coming to me all these years and, and all the people that i've trained um it's not them that's filled i think it's us that has mm. Mm-hmm. And and and, 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 and I, I mean as a collective us, you know, it's it's a case if we if we hit everyone with a hammer, they all end up looking like a nail, don't they? Mm-hmm. So it's something like really, really just. I mean, and for people who are neurodivergent, it's so vital that we, you know, that we basically that we meet them in a person-centered way. Yes, and that we're Not aware, in- and that we're observant, and that and that hopefully the world opens up to being able to support and integrate even even more than it is currently and thinking about that idea of observation and support going back a little to talk about the eating disorders so we've talked perhaps about what they how they might present themselves in the individual but how can how can people around those eating disorders perhaps in a family environment or in a in a in a friend environment, how can they observe and then support someone who needs help but maybe hasn't quite realised or thinks what they're experiencing is quite normal? Or how can we? Oh, it's support? it's an absolute minefield, isn't mm. it? I mean, it's uh, parents are, 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 they're they're in a very very difficult position. And I'm certainly knowing COVID, um, so many people, eating disorders, A, escalated through the absolute roof. Um, but parents realised phenomenally that their children were either not eating at all. You know, the, 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 the little trick that, so I, I ate at school and, you know, I, I, I've i already had a big lunch and I, I also ate Billy's or Peter's or Sally's or whoever. And then the parents realised they were actually living on fresh air when they came back. Um, and it's something about, um, it, it's, it's, it's a, big skill um, and I think if any parent out here is listening and um, is really worried about their child I would really really invite you to to buy the uh, G- um, Jenny Langley, Jill Todd's and Janet Treasure's book um, Caring for Your Loved Ones with Eating Disorders it's brilliant mm-hmm. um, and and it will give you the language because it's really important because so many parents who through fear Will, will actually make the eating disorder go further underground and enforce it more. So you really, you know, if you have got, if you're worried about your loved one, it's really important you educate yourself and you don't go in like a rhinoceros because it will impact negatively, despite the fact that I, I get absolutely, my parents get so, so terrified. And I'll put links to all of these references that you've, that yes. you've kindly given us, Bernie, when I, when I do the, the, um, blurb yes and of course friends and partners I guess as well I mean I didn't tell anyone about my binge eating for oh gosh it's probably 25 years that I had it yeah and no nobody knew you know wrappers down the side of the sofa excuses to go out and buy petrol and buy as many chocolate bars as I could and eating them in the car on the way home and you know all those kinds of behaviors because if we don't want anyone to know about it, eating in secret is it's actually quite easy to do, isn't it? You know, you can do it late at night and, you know, and so sometimes partners don't necessarily know. So I guess the plea from us both, I'm sure, and from any other professionals listening would be to, if that is you, to connect with someone professional to try and help, help you. Absolutely, please do, because... 
you know, people think that they're on their own and there are thousands and thousands and thousands of people doing exactly the behavior that you think you're the only one doing. Mm. And that's it, isn't it, Laura? That's it's a case of us, you know, as, as we know, doing what we do. Mm. Um, and yes. And so, so when when you put the conversation out there with your loved ones, it's something about you know some people say that they um, some people say that they they find eating sort of uh, foods that are you know that, um, that, that make them feel better, like loads of chocolates and that, because uh, uh, that ring true for you. So separate, so separate the the. the uh, the chance so don't say I've seen that you've been eating I've found all these these sweet track trackers just ask your child you know is there is there anything that you're you, you, that you need to talk to me about mm -hmm. you know, is there any and if you find those old track trackers um, you know wrappers or whatever they are it's, it's fried anyway yes <laughs> exactly <laughs> we know what you mean yes I, I'm bad enough on a Monday <laughs> um, and, and just to sort of say that I you know I, I, know, I noticed that um you know I, I went into your room and I know I, I did actually you know find these um and it's absolutely okay but I wonder what you're really trying to tell me yes is there anything you'd like to tell yes. me yes rather than you know if you start criticizing the behavior mm. then, the, then the eating disorder the disordered eating what everyone would call it would go further down just goes further underground doesn't it yes because because it's and of course the longer it goes on the more shameful it 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 feels and then it's harder to talk to your your husband wife partner friend about it um but from from my experience I will just say the minute you do the feeling of liberation is I mean I could cry now and it was oh, a while ago yeah, that yeah. I first did you yeah. know that it just makes such a difference because just that sharing you know makes such a makes such an impact doesn't it you don't feel like you're you're alone and you're some freak sitting in the corner with a with a chocolate bar and you're as sick as your secrets and that's yeah. it, it you yeah. really are and 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 you know that's that's really sad that you, you that you had that for so long mm -hmm. and, and another thing i would also say is, is 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 please don't congratulate anyone for weight loss ever ever Yes. Um, and if you think that your child's losing a lot of weight or your loved one losing a lot of weight overnight don't please don't tell them you're, my goodness you're getting so thin you're so you're oh, please don't tell them they're going to die um because it's it, fear doesn't work and if you tell them they're thin they think wow and then if you tell them they think you think they look well when they start gaining health that that creates a terrible problem too so you need to learn the language of how to speak to you yes know. and of course a lot of work well, disorders um eating disorders with younger people is about supporting that family unit isn't it and about I'm helping the, the right language at home because to your point earlier if we can start earlier with any of the disordered eating behavior we can then prevent someone from having a lifetime of discomfort mm -hmm. poor health anxiety unhappiness yeah it's it's uh, you wouldn't wish an eating disorder on anyone and anyone uh, your worst enemy mm. and yet for a while in the beginning in the throes of it all you can be quite euphoric until it until it turns into your enemy until it turns into the puppet master yes very yes. very nice. yes yes exactly oh bernie gosh doesn't time fly well maybe we'll have to, <laughs> maybe we'll have to have you on again at some point to, to explore more about the you know these these such fascinating topics but just to bring it to a close then um if somebody wants to help themselves or help someone close to them where should they go how should they go about that make sure that they get practitioners who have got experience with um food ways and shape mm -hmm. people like yourself um the national center they they have a, a list of people who can help um mm. and just to and, and to make sure that if you do whoever you choose has got experience in this subject mm. um and it needs to be someone who and make, check and see how long the train has been mm. you know remember to ask the questions that you know you're, 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 you're buying a service yes you're interviewing them really aren't you yes, yes. 
make sure that you ask what, what experience they've got, how much they have I've been doing it for, what's their experience. Yes. Make sure that they're, or you can contact me. I, I, you know, I can always put people in contact. So if you give them, if, my, if you give my link, Laurie. Yes, Bernie, I've, I've, I've got, I've got yeah. loads of practitioners who work, I work very closely with who are superb. Yes. And to understand that dieting and the conventional weight loss marketing that is out there is not the answer if you have any disordered eating pattern at all it's the it's the ultimate disaster mm. it's the road to hell it's the road to hell there's a song there which I'm not I'll, sing it. I'll, I'll sing it i'll sing it for you next time Molly. <laughs> okay well our conversation <laughs> has been anything but hellish it's been absolute heaven it's been so good to have you on bernie to have your wisdom and thank you so much for joining us it's been great being on and i hope to hear from some of you going forward okay thank you thank you bernie thank you